There you go. Now you can hear me, right? All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's Flight Crit Friday. For those of you that are just tuning in, my name is Sean and I am your host. We're going to wait for a little bit for people to pop in and then we'll get started. All right. I got my coffee. Do more. Couldn't agree more. All right. Hopefully that continues to uh, give you some decent audio. If I uh, end up, the audio quality is not good. Hopefully somebody who... Uh, is on the broadcast today will chime in and let me know and I will get that squared away. Well, I sure hope everyone is doing well today on this Friday, August 7th. What happened to the month already? It's uh, we're already a week into August. I can't believe that. All right. I know that I had an, uh, a number of people that uh, were intending to hop on the uh, the call and actually uh, participate today. So I am going to uh, just kind of wait a little bit, and then we're going to get going. I see I got two viewers on right now. That's great. Super excited about that. Um, good morning. Let me see if I can bring up the uh, Q and A tab and also the uh, chat tab. So. Uh, if you are just tuning in and uh, you are not actually on the call because I don't have anybody on the call just yet, I got three people who are viewing it, uh, if you can, over in the group chat, go ahead and uh, over here on uh, this side of your screen, I do believe, just uh, leave me a little message, let me know who is on, who is watching, and... Um, yeah, hopefully we get some of our people that are going to be uh, actually in on the call popping up here pretty quickly. Um, okay, let's see. So today's topic is flight physiology. This is part one of a 14-part series I'm going to be doing on uh, preparing for the flight paramedic exam. We are going to be going over all of the... Um, categories that are covered on the FPC and uh, one at a time breaking it down I'm not going to be covering every my uh, every little detail uh, of uh, each category but I am going to be giving you the um, the key uh, the, the key stuff that you need to know um, to be successful and of course it'll be up to you to do more uh, more preparing on your own if you are looking for some additional assistance uh, in getting ready for the exam, I encourage you to come over to flightcrit.com and you can sign up for my one-on-one -on -one coaching. I am also in the process of creating a 16-week course uh, or a 16-module course that you'll be able to um, participate in. You can sign up, you'll be able to download it uh, from the website, um, and um, you can either download the individual modules or you can download the entire course, and uh, it'll be yours. So um, look for that in the future. If you are interested in that, sign up for my email newsletter. Uh, you can do it on my website, and I will um, I'll let you know when that is available. It's coming soon. I don't have an exact release date or launch date, uh, but it is uh, going to be coming. So um, let me go ahead and send a quick message out to the people who are uh, hoping to be actually in on the call, and then we'll get this uh, we'll get this party started. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. Well, hopefully 
Hopefully we get people popping up. I do know that uh, I can see that there are some people watching. I don't know if you're on uh, the website or if you're on YouTube or if you're viewing it from Google. If you're able to, I'd love to have you uh, drop me a message in the uh, chat box and let me know where are you watching this from? Uh, are you watching it from uh, the website or, or what? So, uh, okay, well, we're about six minutes in. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So, um, welcome. Again, I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Sean Eaton. I am a, a flight paramedic and critical care paramedic. I fly in uh, northern New Mexico and I live in Colorado. And um, I am your host of uh, any number of uh, different sites where you can uh, follow me. Uh, my primary site is flightcrit.com. And uh, I also have a Google page, Google group. I'm all over the place. Um, I'm on um, Facebook and, and Twitter and uh, Periscope is what I've been doing a lot recently. So if you are interested in getting um, short little uh, Flight Crit Fridays, if you will, short little broadcasts, uh, I, uh, I encourage you to go over to Periscope, uh, download the app to your smartphone and follow me at Flight Crit. Hashtag Flight Crit Live. So here we go. Today, flight physiology. We're going to be going over the eight stressors of flight. We're going to be talking about hypoxia, um, which is one of the uh, eight stressors of flight, but we're going to be diving into hypoxia pretty uh, heavily. We're going to be talking about the uh, gas laws, and uh, we're going to go over all uh, of the gas laws with the exception of a couple that really are irrelevant to what we do. Um, and, uh, then we will be, uh, kind of diving in deep to a couple of the gas laws that are really important for the exam that you, uh, absolutely have to know, uh, in order to be successful, uh, at this, um, uh, at this test. We're also going to be, and then uh, at the end, I'm going to touch on a couple other items that, um, I have been, uh, I have seen and people have told me about, uh, showing up on their flight paramedic exam, um, and so that's what we're going to be covering today. I hope that this is uh, helpful. Uh, once this broadcast is done, this will be live. You can go back on YouTube. And uh, I am also uh, going to be creating a little um, a PDF document that you can get by uh, coming over to the uh, website and uh, you can download the PDF document, which is basically uh, my notes for uh, this lecture. All right. Without further ado, if you are, uh, if you were hoping to actually get in on the discussion, um, send me a message through uh, through the question in the Q and A tab for Google Hangouts or uh, on the chat board, and um, I will send you a link to participate. Because as of right now, we have nobody uh, who is in the uh, actual call right now. You could also tweet me if you're having problems, and I will see that pop up, and I will uh, I'll send you an invite. Okay, there we go. Flight physiology. It is um, if you look at the uh, Board of Critical Care Tram Transport Paramedics outline for um, the exam. It is the first category, and uh, it's probably uh, I don't know exactly how many questions uh, are on the exam pertaining to flight physiology. Um, but it's it's one of the larger categories. If you are preparing for the crit certified critical care paramedic exam, this stuff is not going to be on that exam, although it is uh, still uh, really good information. Okay, there are eight stressors of flight that you need to be aware of. The first one being hypoxia. The second one being... do 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 excuse me for a moment, um, thermal changes in the flight environment. The second one, or third one being vibration. Fourth one being dehydration. And we have noise, fatigue, uh, and G-forces. And so those are the broad categories that we're going to be covering on today's broadcast. All right. So hypoxia. Uh, hypoxia is broken into uh, four different types, and um, there will be questions on the exam that say something to the effect of, 
uh, your, pa your patient is suffering um, these effects, what type of a hypoxia uh, might this be? Um, so the four types are hypoxic hypoxia, hypemic hypoxia, stagnant hypoxia, and uh, histotoxic hypoxia. And you can probably figure out what some of those mean just by the names. So the first one we're going to talk about is hypoxic hypoxia. We'll go over that one pretty quickly because I think uh, for the most part, uh, most people understand hypoxia. Um, but just to, to recap, um, you know, hypoxia is the inadequate uh, tissue perfusion at the cellular level or cellular, uh, yeah, tissue perfusion at the cellular level, excuse me. Um, it's also known as altitude hypoxia because in the flight environment, that is the primary um, cause for this type of hypoxia. You take a patient who is already compromised, you take them up the alt altitude where um, the uh, partial pressure of oxygen is lower, and suddenly you've got a patient who's suffering from hypoxia because they're not on, uh, on loading um, the oxygen quite as, as uh, well as they uh, had before. Um, so, uh, this type of hy uh, hypoxia, hypoxic hypoxia is what we call uh, an exchange problem. It's a problem with, uh, the oxygen exchange, um, across, uh, the, uh, the, the, the tissue, uh, uh, the alveolar and uh, capillary uh, membrane. Like I said before, primarily results from a drop in barometric pressure, uh, associated with, um, altitude. It can also result from uh, low FiO2 states. So you've got a patient who is already compromised and uh, you know, they're, they're on a ventilator and you just don't have high enough FiO2. Or uh, their metabolic demand is requiring higher concentrations of oxygen and you're not supplying it. Um, other things that we may not really consider as being um, contributors to hypoxic hypoxia um, would be things like a, a pneumothorax, uh, pneumonia, pulmonary emboli. They fall into this category when we're class when we're trying to classify hypoxia for flight physiology. Um, and, and, and like I said before, it, it's just anything that um, interrupts the exchange uh, of oxygen. Okay, got that? No questions. There is a a, a question. Uh, feature here on uh, on uh, Google Hangouts. So if you have questions, you can type them in uh, on the left hand side, right hand side of your screen. You can type in a question, and it'll pop up, and I'll be able to answer your question. Okay. All right. Next type of hypoxia is your hypemic hypoxia, and this is a transport problem. This is a problem where there's, we just can't simply move the oxygen that's coming into the lungs from the um, capillary bed out to the tissue. Primary cause of this, um, as you can imagine, might be um, uh, blood loss. Okay. Other uh, causes would be things like uh, anemia or um, you know low H and H, anything of that sort, and uh, and then uh, red blood cell mal um, malformation. So the primary one I can think of is sickle cell. Anything that basically prevents the oxygen from being transported out to the tissue. Okay. Um, assuming we don't have some of these other factors that we're going to talk about in a little bit. So hypemic, H-Y-P-E-M-I-C, hypemic hypoxia. And that's a transport problem. Okay, the next one is stagnant hypoxia. And as you can imagine, uh, as the name sound, uh, implies, that is just a loss of flow problem. And that could be um, from a number of uh, reasons. But uh, the main uh, thing to take home, among the main thing to consider is uh, that the blood is just not moving forward. Uh, hmm. All right, we've got a question here. Let's see, uh, do, 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 do. what do we got here? Excuse me for a minute. All right, Jason. Well, thank you for your question, or thank you for your comment here. Um, hopefully, you can get uh, your stuff resolved 
and um, and we'll move on. But if you're able to continue to to stay in uh, in the um, in the queue and watch, uh, please do. Otherwise, like I like I said at the beginning, you'll be able to go back uh, and watch the broadcast uh, through YouTube, and I will share that out uh, at the end with uh, all of our participants. So uh, thanks a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, so going back to stagnant hypoxia, this is just anything that's preventing uh, blood from moving forward. Um, some of the uh, causes of stagnant hypoxia would be low cardiac output. So you've got a patient who's in cardiogenic shock, uh, they're septic, um, anything, uh, anything like that, bradycardic from, from you know, whatever, could be drug overdose, uh, but anything that's reducing your cardiac output. Okay. Excessive positive pressure ventilation, that will also reduce your cardiac output. Uh, remember, by increasing your intrathoracic pressure, you reduce your preload and uh, thus uh, cardiac filling, and therefore uh, your cardiac outflow is reduced, and um, so is your cardiac output. Uh, sepsis, causing blood pooling with a massive vasodilation. Uh, again, you get a decrease in afterload, and uh, decrease in afterload also decreases your cardiac output. So anything that's going to prevent uh, blood from moving forward. Uh, compartment syndrome is also a potential cause. If you've got that constriction, then you don't have a uh, return of uh, blood back to the heart, and that can cause um, the stagnant hypoxia as well. Isolated stagnant hypoxia within that region. Uh, similarly, extended crush situations where you've got a patient who's pinned, maybe they're in a car, uh, building collapse, um, trench collapse, whatever, where you've got that, that, that crush syndrome or that crush situation where it's tamponading the extremity and, and preventing blood flow. Uh, similarly, a massive pulmonary embolism or um, uh, not pulmonary embolism, but, but massive um, DVT. Uh, I've had a patient um, with a uh, occlusion of the, um, the uh, descending aorta right at the bifurcation of the femoral, arter, uh, femoral veins uh, not descending aorta, um, the um, vena cava, the inferior vena cava right at the bifurcation of the uh, femoral veins. And essentially, this patient was completely occluded from the waist down, had a lactate of over 20, and uh, as you can imagine, did not do very well. Um, and then venous pooling from inactivity, uh, yeah, that, that's why um, we get these patients who are, uh, you know, who develop blood clots and pulmonary embolisms because they've been sitting in a car for, you know, five hours. Um, so another, another cause for, uh, for that stagnant hypoxia. And then last is the histotoxic hypoxia. And this is basically poisoning. This is um, a, a problem with usage. The oxygen is there. It just cannot be used for any number of reasons. Um, carbon monoxide is bound to the, the hemoglobin and, um, we think a lot about carbon monoxide binding to the hemoglobin and then preventing the offload, uh, the onloading of uh, oxygen. But what it also does is it, 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 it triggers a change in the hemoglobin so that what oxygen it is binding, it holds on to tighter. And so uh, the oxygen's there. It may not be sufficient, but the oxygen is there. It's, it's bound to the hemoglobin, but it the hemoglobin just won't off gas. It won't offload that oxygen to the tissue, and so it causes uh, it causes hypoxia. Um, cyanide is another cause. Cyanide interrupts that last step in the electron transport chain, and uh, and and so that can cause um, some hypoxic uh, complications at the tissue level. Uh, and then, of course, other poisoning. And then I just mentioned smoking because. Um, you know, in, in EMS, there seems to be so many people who, uh, who smoke and, um, you know, they're just kind of, they're causing themselves hypoxia. All right. So those are the four, four stages of hypoxia. Just to recap, we've got the histotoxic, stagnant, hypemic, and hypovolemic. Okay. Um, some of the early signs of hypoxia, uh, tend to be hunger and fatigue. And, you know, this can really be a challenge in the flight environment because we're used to working long shifts. Many of us are working 24s, 48-hour shifts. I even know some services that allow their crews to work five, six, seven days straight, and that's just insane to me. I work 48s, and sometimes we are just slammed, and I am so exhausted. And even when I am well-rested, 
I have had a quiet night. I've been able to sleep all night and, uh, you know, I'm well rested, um, you know, get that flight. And suddenly I'm yawning and I'm thinking, wow, this is so strange. Why am I yawning? I had a great night's sleep. Hypoxia. Okay. Um, the base I fly at starts out at above 7,000 feet. And we're regularly flying at 12, 13, 14,000 feet, even 15 or 16,000 feet from time to time. And uh, so, you know, I constantly have to remind myself that, uh, hey, you know, we're, we're at altitude. I'm probably going to be a little hypoxic. And uh, um, that may be why I'm tired. Same with hunger. You know, we try to eat, um, try to keep ourselves well nourished. Um, but if, you know, for whatever reason you start noticing that you're fatigued, you're tired, that might be some early signs of hypoxia. So you might uh, need to consider that maybe throw on, uh, throw on a non rebreather yourself, you know, take some really good, uh, deep breaths and, and, uh, and then see, you know, reevaluate and see if you, uh, need to, need to abort or need to uh, change your, your flight plan. All right. So hypoxia is broken up into four stages. And these stages are generally divided up by altitude because we are talking flight physiology. We're talking about different stages of hypoxia as they asso as so are associated with the flight environment. So the first stage of hypoxia generally occurs between sea level and 10,000 feet. Uh, this is called the indifferent stage. And, and generally, most people are able to compensate without any problems, without any real symptoms within this, uh, this stage of hypoxia. Um, it may not even be noticeable. Uh, if there are symptoms, they're probably going to be mild tachycardia, uh, mild fatigue, maybe a little bit of increased respirations, but that's really going to depend on the individual. If you come from sea level and now you're flying a patient up and over a range, um, you know, and you're at eight, nine, 10,000 feet, you're probably going to feel the effects of that. Where I used to work back east, we were a couple hundred feet above sea level. But if I happen to do a, a transport to the western part of the state, I could very easily be up at six, seven, eight thousand feet, and and I would notice that. Um, something to note: if you're flying under goggles, and I think most services are night vision starts to be degraded at as low as 5,000 feet uh, MSL. Okay, let's think about that. Uh, where I'm flying, like uh, currently, we're starting off at 7,000 feet. Now, um, you know, most people acclimate to that. I live, or where I live, I'm above 5,000 feet, um, but already my night, my night vision is being degraded so the parameters, the capabilities of the night vision goggles um, that are advertised by the manufacturer are already less. So those are things that we need to keep in mind when we're doing seam flights and we're going to, into an uh, unfamiliar LZ, we're under goggles, um, our, our night vision is, is already going to be de uh, degraded if we're above 10,000 feet. And then, uh, you know, like I said, mild fatigue. Okay, the next stage of uh, hypoxia is the compensatory stage. Uh, this generally occurs between 10,000 and 15,000 feet. This is, uh, this is the stage where most people uh, are able to compensate, but you're probably going to start to notice some symptoms associated with the altitude. I know that where I live here in Colorado, we have a lot of 14,000 uh, plus foot peaks, and even though I spend a lot of time at seven, 8,000, 9,000 feet, you know, when I go up and I'm, I'm exerting myself and um, I'm up on top of those peaks, I, I feel it. Um, some of the things that I start to notice, I can tell that I'm breathing uh, faster. My heart rate is up. I'm feeling more tired. Um, I remember the first couple of times I went up and did some 14ers, uh, I started to notice that um, I was a little more fatigued. Uh, I, my judgment was a little bit off. I found myself doing simple math problems just to try and make sure that I wasn't becoming, um, you know, too hypoxic and too affected by the altitude. Um, but uh, my coordination was a little off. I was walking slower. So those are things that we need to keep in mind. If we're up at high altitude uh, in an unpressurized cabin, um, then these are the things that uh, are going to affect our ability to care for our patient. If especially if we're, we're taking care of a complicated patient, we're going to have to be thinking about, um, you know doing drug calculations and vent changes and monitoring balloon pumps and you know is the is the timing right you know is are we having a, a problem with the the pump um if we have an in-flight emergency you, know, you got to make quick decisions and all of these um high level decision making um functions are going to be degraded due to the altitude 
Um, and keep in mind there the your ability to compensate for these uh, uh, stages of hypoxia, the, your ability to compensate for hypoxia is affected by um, your physical conditioning. Uh, how fast have you um, ascended? So if you're used to working at 5,000 feet or less, 1,000 feet, feet, and now you've taken a patient, uh, you've rapidly climbed up over a mountain range, and you're going to have to maintain that elevation for a significant period of time, you are probably going to be affected more uh, by that rapid ascent. Other things that are going to affect you, are you tired? Are you eating well? Uh, do you have other st uh, stressors that are going on that are uh, complicating um, or that are uh, impacting uh, your ability to manage those uh, the the altitude. Okay, next we get into the disturbance disturbance stage. This occurs between fifteen thousand and twenty thousand feet. Uh, this is the elevation at which most people are no longer able to compensate without uh, assistance, uh, primarily oxygen. Um, at this altitude, our vision starts to be degraded. Um, we might speak slower, we might have slurred speech, people who are not used to this altitude maybe uh, may appear drunk, um, your coordination is going to be affected, your reaction time is going to be affected, your judgment is going to be affected, and uh, this is that stage at which uh, you you probably want to be on oxygen if you're flying in an, uh, in an unpressurized cabin. Um, I'll, I'll make note, I do have it noted below, um, but uh, just to uh, or I'll get to it in a little bit, but just to um, kind of inject this right now, uh, according, let's see, what is it? Um, part 135-89 of the um, CFR, of the, the regulations, Code Federal Regulations uh, for Air Medical Transport says that all crew members, uh, when flying above 10,000 feet for greater than 30 minutes, must be on oxygen. And if you are flying at an altitude greater than twelve thousand feet, you got to be on oxygen for any uh, for any period of time. So if you're flying in one of these for flying for one of these services, and again, this is in an unpressurized cabin. So uh, you know it, where I fly, we have uh, a manifold system set up so that the crew members can just quickly slap on a nasal cannula and get a little bit of supplemental oxygen. Okay, so uh, very important to remember. Um, right. So, uh, and then the next stage is the critical stage. It's greater than 20,000 feet. At this point, um, you know, most people cannot function um, for any length of time uh, without, uh, without supplemental oxygen. Um, there's generally a rapid onset of confusion, and if not addressed, this uh, can lead to loss of consciousness and, and death. Wow. Not nearly as many people as I was hoping were going to be hopping on here. I had a lot of really good feedback, but... Um, Anyway, this will be available to uh, people uh, who want to follow up uh, after the fact on, on uh, YouTube. You can watch it there, and I'll probably also uh, share it on my website as well. Again, flightcrit.com. That's where you can find uh, all kinds of great information that I'm putting out there about uh, passing the FPC exam. I also have uh, coaching on there that you can sign up for. And um, right on. Okay, we're going to move on to the next stage here, the next topic here in just a minute. All right, uh, time of useful consciousness. This is a, another factor that you know, they need to, to consider. And th there are questions on the exam uh, concerning the time of useful con consciousness. So the time of useful, useful consciousness, what is this? This is basically from, this is basically uh, pertaining to uh, pressurized cabins with a rapid uh, decompression. Okay, and this is the amount of time from the onset of the rapid decompression to the point at which you lose your ability to correct um, correct the situation. So you're not necessarily unconscious, but you've now become so incapacitated that you can't protect yourself. You cannot uh, address or manage the, the crisis. And this is uh, assuming, these numbers that I'm about to give you are assuming good physical health and good rest. And... Uh, it's important to realize that if you are, um, if you are fatigued or you are sick, then uh, these numbers can be reduced by up to fifty percent. Okay, uh, time versus altitude at around twenty thousand feet with a rapid decompression. 
uh, you've got about 30 minutes of useful consciousness. At that point, um, uh, you know, you're going to, you're in trouble at 25,000 feet. You you have approximately three to five minutes. Now there's a significant decrease here and there's a good reason for this. We're going to talk about the gas laws here in a little bit. Um, but we're going to talk about Dalton's law and, um, Graham's law, I think is the also the other one that, uh, uh, kind of go, uh, plays into effect here. But uh, essentially at 25,000 feet, the, the partial pressure of oxygen in your blood exceeds the partial pressure of oxygen at your alveolar level. Okay, so what happens? We know that oxygen moves by um, uh, diffusion from an area of uh, high pressure to an area of low pressure. When you suddenly have lower pressure outside the lung, you're going to get an active transport of oxygen out of the blood into the alveoli, and you'll be breathing it out. So that's why you have this rapid decrease in um, time of useful consciousness once you reach that 25,000 foot mark. At 35,000 feet with a rapid decompression, you have less than a minute, uh, approximately 30 seconds to 60 seconds of time of useful consciousness. And at 45,000 feet, uh, you have between 10 and 15 seconds. If you notice when you travel on an airliner, they generally say we'll be traveling at about 35,000 feet. Uh, I have no idea if this has anything to do with that, but I can, some, I can, uh, hypothesize that that is intended to give the pilots a chance to get down before they were to lose consciousness in the event of a rapid decompression. Um, should you have a rapid decompression at these high ele uh, elevations, uh, the most important thing to do is uh, provide yourself supplemental oxygen that is going to extend your useful consciousness and then the pilot will rapidly descend to below 10,000 feet. Okay. So combating the effects of hypoxia, uh, try to remember the DEATH acronym, D-E-A-T-H. These are things to avoid that uh, will improve your uh, ability to manage the effects of hypoxia. So uh, D stands for drugs, avoid drugs. Uh, and that that's not just illicit drugs, but that's... <laughs> what? That was our new cat. <laughs> um, so drugs can affect your ability to uh, um, manage hypoxia uh, in any number of ways. Uh, of course, exhaustion, stay well rested, uh, Alcohol affects your ability to uh, to stay alert and uh, combat the effects of hypoxia. Tobacco, primarily because of the uh, carbon monoxide, uh, uh, again you know, prevents uh, your your hemoglobin from binding uh, from binding oxygen, but then also releasing oxygen, and then hypoglycemia. Um, I already mentioned the uh, 14 CFR Part 135-89. You can look that up, uh, but again, that says crew members. Um, must be on oxygen if flying over 10,000 feet for greater than 30 minutes and uh, must be on oxygen anytime they're over 12,000 feet. All right, does anybody have any questions before we get on to the next uh, stress of flight, which is going to be thermal changes? Any questions? No chat comments, no questions. Okay. Well, I want to appreciate, I want to tell you guys, uh, thank you for hanging with me. We're going to be moving right along here. This broadcast may go over an hour. Um, but we've got some great information. I don't want, uh, I don't want you to lose. Okay. All right. Moving on to our next stress of flight, we got thermal changes, and we're going to bang through these next stressors of flight uh, pretty quickly because um, there's not a whole lot we can do about a lot of them, and they're just not as uh, in in depth as hypoxia, and they're just not covered as heavily on the exam. But they are they do show up from time to time. Uh, okay, so the first one, thermal changes. Increase, uh, big, big problem with thermal changes is it increases our energy consumption and it can affect clotting. We all know that uh, trauma patients who are hypothermic uh, bleed. So we need to make sure that we're keeping not only our patients uh, warm and cool, uh, 
uh, but ourselves, uh, primarily for the thermal uh, for the fatigue factor. Um, according to the Kames, uh, they require documentation of corrective measures if uh, the cabin temperature is less than 50 degrees or greater than 95. I don't know if that will actually show up on the exam, but there are Kames questions, and so uh, that is and that is definitely being um, focused on heavily by Kames lately. So. I, I throw that in there because that may show up on your test. The next one is vibration. Vibration is a really uh, big uh, issue in helicopters. Not so much, I would say, in the fixed wing flights. Uh, although I have been a few, uh, been in a few uh, um, turboprops that are pretty uh, not really not not that smooth. Um, but uh, vibration uh, causes fatigue. And that's the big thing. I've noticed it uh, significantly, uh, even between aircrafts. Uh, I fly in two different aircrafts. One of them is one of them is an Augusta 109. It's a twin engine, and it um, it's got quite a bit of vibration. Uh, the newest aircraft that I've been flying in is the uh, the A Star B3, and it just seems to be a lot more smooth. So, um, some of those things you just can't, you just don't have any effect. Or any control over. Um, the bet, what, what you can do is uh, limit your contact with the aircraft frame and uh, use good cushioning. If you are in an aircraft that's got, um, you know, poor seat cushions or what or whatnot, um, you know, have your mechanics swap those things out. And uh, yeah, that's a safety factor. If you're if you're becoming more fatigued because the uh, because you're you're coming into contact with the aircraft, uh, that's a problem. Um, same goes for your patient. If you've got those big patients, try to uh, you know, prevent them from leaning against the, the side of the air, airframe. All right. Dehydration is another big one. Um, there have been reports of cabin, temp, uh, cabin humidity, or cabin, and R, cabin RH being as low as 1% on extended, um, pre, uh, extended transports of a, uh, um, within a, a pressurized cabin. And so um, keep that in mind. Uh, low humidity increases fatigue, and uh, it, it doesn't only just uh, affect patients uh, in a pressurized cabin. When you're flying at high altitude, the, uh, the humidity also decreases. Uh, air conditioning units, um, in most aircraft, that's how they cool the, the cabin is through evaporation, and uh, that's, of course, going to decrease the humidity in the cabin. Uh, ventilators, just by uh, their nature, have a tendency to um, extract moisture from the air that you're providing to a patient. So keep that in mind. Uh, it can it can have a significant um, effect on the circulating fluid volume of your patient. We lose it's liters, I think. I think the majority of the the fluid that we lose each day is through digestion and through ventilation. And I think uh, just respiration um, has the greatest effect on fluid loss. Uh, so how can, we, how can we manage this? Provide humidified O2 uh, to your patient, whether that's through a bubbler, if they're on a nasal cannula. Um, you can throw an HME. If you're not familiar with an HME, it's a heat and moisture exchanger. It's a little uh, device that you throw on um, between the... Um, um, between the end tidal CO2 and the ET tube for ventilated patients, and it just keeps that moisture and that warmth inside their lungs. And then uh, for crew members, just hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Um, I know I'm I'm sitting here drinking coffee, so uh, you know that's not the best thing. But um, you know I, I don't go back to work until tomorrow, and uh, I will be I'll be hydrating uh, the rest of the day, and uh, I I drink you know liters um, each day when I'm on shift. Okay, next uh, next stress is noise. This is a big one. Um, Kames, I believe, recommends it. Uh, I don't think it's a requirement, but I think most flight services out there are requiring the use of hearing protection uh, and, he and, and helmets uh, in the flight environment. Um, the FAA has done a study and um, looked at the... Um, the noise level in various aircrafts, and I will be including that, uh, the results of that study, uh, in a little graph, little box uh, in the uh, PDF that'll be available on the website once this broadcast is done. But um, most 
excuse me, most helicopters uh, range from 90 to 110 decibels inside the cabin. That is enough to cause permanent hearing loss and leads to significant amount of fatigue. Uh, it is recommended that um, both crew members and patients wear hearing protection. Of course, we all know that uh, it's very difficult to uh, to provide hearing prote ad adequate hearing protection to patients who are immobilized with their head blocked. Uh, but some you know some things you can do is stuff earplugs, foam earplugs in. You can roll up gauze pads and uh, and tape that over their ears. But just do what you can. Um, it is recommended that crew members wear both earmuffs as well as earplugs to protect their he hearing. Now, of course, a lot of what I've been talking about, uh, these, these different um, stressors of flight result in fatigue, but fatigue itself is a stressor of, stressor of flight. And there are many, many uh, effects, or are many, many causes for fatigue beyond uh, just these other stressors, uh, sleep deprivation, um, you know, routine shift work uh, when you're not, uh, you know, that occurs in between calls doing base chores and QA and all that stuff. Uh, PRs effect, yeah, that's a big one. A lot, a lot of time the PRs happen when you're out in the sun um, or in the summer when it's hot. Uh, it's just simply shift work is another uh, thing that affects fatigue. Um, you know, I know a lot of us work these 12, 24, 48-hour shifts, like I said previously, and uh, it's just so important to make sure that we're getting our getting adequate rest. Um even intense periods of uh, concentration. If you are running back-to-back -back uh, flights and you're dealing with complicated patients, that's going to have a toll on you. That's going to cause uh, increased fatigue. So uh, you, know, you got to be aware of that, and you've got to you've got to take steps to get to combat uh, that fatigue. Um, the FA FA 14 CFR 135.271 does require that even uh, air medical crew members get eight hours of rest prior to a shift. Now, I think um, that doesn't, unfortunately, that does not specifically say sleep time. It just says, it just means rest. And that that can mean, and what most employers take it to mean is just time away from work. Um some other recommendations for combating the effects of fatigue is, is just take short and frequent naps. If you're on shift, um, I know uh, we have a policy that we you know, try to take naps in the middle of the afternoon if we're not, uh, not flying. Um, you want to avoid what they call sleep inertia, and that is where your body gets in these deep stages of REM sleep where if you were to then wake up, uh, you end up feeling more fatigued. So generally what I'll do is I'll take a 45-minute nap, couple times throughout the day. Uh, don't quite get into that really deep rest, but it does um, have a profound effect on my fatigue level. And then the final stage of uh, uh, our stressor of flight are G-forces. And we're not going to touch too much on this, but because it doesn't really have a whole lot of effect um, on crew members, uh, but it does have more of an effect on uh, our patients. Um, the direction of the G-forces has a greater effect than the amount of g-forces generally in our environment we don't experience great deal of, of g-forces uh, maybe if you're if you're doing a lot of fixed wing flights and uh, you know, during takeoff but um, things to consider would be a patient's pathology and how you might position them in the aircraft if you have um if you have the ability to reposition them. So um, something that uh, you might think about is, you know, the majority of the G-forces are on takeoff and ascent. So you know, if you've got a patient with a big head injury, you, know, you may want their head towards the nose of the aircraft so that um, during that takeoff phase and during the ascent, the blood's not being forced to their, to their head, it's being forced to their feet and helping reduce uh, their ICP. So. Okay, that's it for stresses of flight. Just do a quick recap. We had hypoxia. We had thermal changes. We had vibration. We had dehydration. We have noise. We have fatigue itself. And then the G-forces. Those are the stresses of flight. And the points that I hit on are the big ones that uh, you'll see pop up on the exam. Okay, any questions on that before we get going?
I'm going to just give you a, give a, a few moments uh, for people to uh, post their questions. Jason, I hope you're still on. Uh, if not, um, hey, uh, hopefully you're getting uh, you're getting some value out of this when you watch the replay. Any questions? Okay, no questions. Moving on to gas laws. Yes, our favorite. Everybody loves gas laws. We're going to be talking about the, the more, majority of the gas laws. We're going to be going over Boyle's Law, Dalton's Law, Charles' Law, Henry's Law, and Graham's Law. So those are the biggest ones. You, you have to know those for the exam. Um, some you need to know more than others. The first two that we're going to touch on are Boyle's Law and Dalton's Law. Those two you have to know cold. Those are the two that show up on the exam every single time, and um, you have to be able to apply those. So if you if you missed uh, my first Flight Crit Friday broadcast on uh, the introduction to the FPC exam, go back and watch that one. I talk about uh, why it's so important to really understand the these concepts, not just be able to regurgitate them. Okay, so Boyle's Law. We're going to start off uh, um, with Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law balloon. Yeah, Boyle's balloon. Just remember balloon. Boyle's balloon. I'm going to say that again. I'll say that a few more times to kind of pound that into your head. Boyle's balloon. Okay, what happens when a balloon goes up in the air? Um, if you, you know, I watched the, uh, what was it called? Um, Jump from Space. It was the Felix Bumgardner. Um, dude, it was uh, a... Uh, a Red Bull uh, promotion where this guy rode in a capsule up to the uh, the fringe of the stratosphere and jumped out and skydived back to Earth. And the thing that you notice is this gigantic balloon that carried up carried him up into space. Um, it, it as he got higher and higher, it got larger and larger. So as balloons rise, they become larger. Why is that? Well, Boyle's law says that as the volume uh, the volume in a uh, volume goes up as PSI or as pressure goes down, given a, a set volume. If you are are set um, temperature, there you go. Set temperature. So the way you would uh, the way you would uh, let's see if I can blah, 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 blah. let me show you the way Boyle's law might be written uh, on an exam. You'll have P1 over P2 is equal to V2 over V1. All right. So that's how Boyle's Law. Let me write that down. Boyle's Law. All right. P1 over P2 equals V1 over V2. As the pressure goes down, volume goes up. Vice versa. Vice versa. As pressure goes down, did I already say that? Pressure goes down, volume goes up. Pressure goes up, volume goes down. Okay? So why do we care about this? Okay, well, think about it. You're taking a patient from a certain altitude. You're going to put them into a helicopter. You're going to put them into an airplane, and you're going to fly up to a higher altitude. Uh, so, you know, ET cuffs, okay, they're going to expand. Uh, if somebody's got a pneumo, whether it be a pneumocephalus, um, uh, you know, pul um, um, tension pneumo or uh, pneumothorax, um, you know, uh, pneumomediastinum. A anywhere they've got trapped air in their body is going to be affected by these pressure changes. So you have to be aware of that. Um, that may be a cause to tell your pilot, hey, I need you to fly as low as possible. Or if you're in a pressurized cabin, hey, how low can you dial in uh, the, the pressure? Okay. You need to be aware of that. Uh, other things that might be affected by... Uh, by Boyle's law is uh, Foley's, uh, NG tubes, uh, etc. So Boyle's law, uh, you know, just think of balloon. As the balloon goes up, the air pressure drops, the balloon gets bigger. Okay? The next one is Dalton's law. Dalton's law is the law of partial pressure. And this is a law that tells us the amount of oxygen um, we, uh, we breathe in um, stays the same no matter what our altitude is. Um, but it also tells us that um, we need to use we need to deliver more oxygen 
um, for higher altitudes because of partial pressures. The law of partial pressure. Dalton's law equals the total total pressure, PT. Okay? PT is equal to P1 plus P2 plus Pn. Okay? P1 plus P2 plus Pn equals PT. Okay. Basically what that says is the total partial pressure of a gas is equal to the sum of all the partial pressures of its constituents or its parts. Okay. So we know that oxygen, roughly 21% oxygen, what is it, like 78% nitrogen, and you know, 1% of other stuff. Okay. And so that percentage doesn't change. Okay. But how do we figure out um, what the what the partial pressure of oxygen is? Well, you multiply uh, the atmospheric pressure, okay, because that's the pressure that we're starting with, the atmospheric pressure by 0.21, and that's going to give you the partial pressure of oxygen in the air we're breathing. Now that does not mean that um, that is the partial pressure of the oxygen at the alveoli. Um, that is actually reduced because of water vapor pressure and, um, and CO2, uh, increased level of CO2 in the alveoli. Um, what we know is that the partial pressure of oxygen at sea level under normal atmospheric conditions, we, we use 760 uh, torr uh, as, our, as our baseline, that we have a partial pressure of about 160 uh, tor uh, of oxygen. Well, now because of vapor pressure and CO2 at the alveoli, we get about 105. I think it's right around 105 is the partial pressure of oxygen uh, in the lungs, 100 and, in the alveoli, 104, 105, something like that. Okay. So take into consideration you've got a patient that uh, you take from altitude, now you climb up to, you know, five, 6,000 feet. Maybe you're, you know, you're at sea level and you put them into a pressurized cabin. Now, most pressurized cabins are pressurized between six and 8,000 feet. So now you have that reduction in atmospheric pressure. And there is a graph, and I will also include that in our, in our notes, uh, in the show notes. So uh, when you come on over to, to the site, um, flightcrit.com and look at the blog, you'll see, uh, you'll see the show notes. You'll be able to download. Uh, you'll see some of those show notes. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to put it on the blog or if it's just going to be a download that you can get. Um, but that, that chart will be in there. And it's going to tell you generally how much atmospheric pressure drops per 1,000 feet of elevation. But we do know that as you go up in elevation, the atmospheric pressure drops. Does that mean the concentration of oxygen drops? No, it's still 21%. But the partial pressure of oxygen is going to go down because it's now 21% of whatever the lower atmospheric pressure is. And, and that's very important to realize. Um, on my blog at flightcrit.com, I do have a post um, that talks about um, the two gas laws, Boyles and Dalton. You can go over there and you can look at that and I break down and really uh, show you exactly how to figure out how much additional oxygen a patient will need uh, depending on how high, uh, how much elevation gain uh, you're, you're, uh, you're going to take them, you're going to subject them to. Okay, so Dalton's law, the law of partial pressure, PT equals P1 plus P2 plus PN. Okay, the next one is Charles' law. And for Charles, just think Celsius. C is for Celsius, okay? It's the law of temperature, okay? Basically what it says is as the temperature goes down, the pressure goes down. And uh, as, the, as the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up, um, assuming a standard volume. Okay, now this doesn't have a whole lot of effect on our patients, but what this does uh, affect is the aircraft performance. And uh, if you've been flying for any length of time or you're getting ready to or you're preparing to flight um, or to, to transition into uh, flight, you'll hear the term density altitude. Density altitude is um, a, a term that pilots will use to talk about, you know, how does the aircraft perform uh, at the current altitude under the current atmospheric conditions, specifically temperature and humidity. Um, I'm not going to try and explain how humidity affects the density altitude because to be honest with you, I don't know. Um, I've tried to understand it, but, uh, but I struggle to understand it. But I do know that temperature does affect it. So as the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. But think of the density of the air goes down, right? Because the air expands, the molecules are farther apart. The air is less dense. And... Um, 
And so the aircraft doesn't perform as well. So, uh, you know, even though we may start off at 7,000 feet where I'm flying now, uh, if it's really hot, uh, the density altitude may be 8,500 feet. And so the aircraft is going to perform like it's at a higher altitude. Okay, so Charles Law, C is for Celsius. Okay, Henry. Henry loves his Heineken beer. Henry's Law. Henry Heineken. All right, Henry's Law says that the amount of gas dissolved in a, in a solution is proportional to the pressure of the gas above it. Okay, what, is, what does that really mean? What it means is that gas wants to be in equilibrium. Okay, just think about uh, equilibrium. If the pressure pushing down is equal to the pressure pushing up, there's no movement. Okay, so you take your beer, your Coke, whatever it might be, and you pop that top. Okay, and suddenly you get a you get a fizz. You get all that the the, the CO two gas bubbles out of it. Why is that? That's because when those bottles are packaged, they're pressurized. They're pressurized with carbon dioxide and then they put the cap on. And so there's more CO2 inside the liquid than is in the space above the liquid. Okay. Now you got that, that cap, it's on there snug and CO2 is going to diffuse out of that beer and it's going to collect in that little space between the cap and the top of the top of the beer. And at some point, the amount of CO2 that's in the in that little space is going to equal what's in the liquid, and you're not going to get any more release. But now suddenly you take that top off, and uh, now you are exposing your beer to the atmospheric pressure, okay? The partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere is very little compared to the partial pressure of the CO2 in the beer, and that's why it fit, uh, bubbles, and that's why uh, over time it goes flat. If you're like me, I like nitro beer, okay? I hope you like nitro beer. Um, nitro stout, that's my favorite. Um, if you notice, a nitro beer does not go flat nearly as fast as a regular beer. Why? Think about it. What's the percentage of nitrogen in our atmosphere? 71% or 78%. 78%. So you've got a greater partial pressure of nitrogen pushing down on the nitrogen that's in that beer. So you have less release of the nitrogen from the beer. So therefore it stays, it doesn't go flat. It stays fizzier longer. Okay? And that's all because of Henry's law. Okay. Now, how does this affect our patient? Well, decom decompression sickness is the biggest one that we think about. Um, when we, when we think about scuba divers that have gone down, uh, you know, um, you know, they've been down for a while, um, higher pressure, uh, you know, from the water, right. H higher atmospheric pressure. And there is a, uh, a way, uh, there is a calculation for the number of atmospheres that a person is, um, subjected to when they go below the sea level. And I'll also put that, um, in, uh, the, the, um, uh, the PDF, um, make a note of that. Okay. And, um, so it forces more nitrogen into your, into your tissue, right? You're, you're breathing that in, it goes into your lungs, it's inert, but it diffuses into your tissue. Now, when you come back up and you're no longer subjected to those higher, uh, atmosphere, atmospheric pressures. Now, um, you know, that nitrogen is going to diffuse out of your tissue. Well, if it diffu diffuses out of your tissue too fast, gets into your bloodstream, gives you the bends. Okay. Same can go for um, uh, very large patients. So if you have a patient with a very high um, BMI, okay, their you know, fat holds nitrogen much more than muscle or regular tissue. So if you have somebody who is um, very large, it's highly recommended, and, and you're going to be taking them from a low low altitude to a very high altitude, and there's going to be a drastic change in <clears throat> excuse me, that, uh, that pressure, you better be, um, hyper oxygenating them before you put them in that aircraft and take them up to altitude because they will off gas nitrogen. They can have nitrogen narcosis. They can have the bends and it can really cause you problems. So high flow, non rebreather, really super oxygenate them ahead of time. And, uh, and that will, that will help your patients.
Okay, so that is uh, Henry's law. All right, uh, Graham's law. Graham's law we'll talk just briefly about. Um, Graham's law is the law of gaseous, gaseous diffusion, and this is the law that um, tells us that, our, uh, that gas is going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration and vice versa. Um, well, no, sorry. It's going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And that is how oxygen moves from, um, from our alveoli into our blood and from our blood into our tissue and vice versa, how CO2 diffuses from our tissue into our blood and from our blood into uh, our alveoli for uh, off-gassing. Okay? And that's really all you need to know. Um, moves by uh, a pressure gradient. Um, and the pressure gradient is affected by concentrations. All right. That is our, that is it for gas laws. Uh, just to recap, we have Boyle's law. Remember Boyle's balloon. We have Dalton's law, and I don't have a good way to remember this, but Dalton's law is the law of partial pressure. This is PT equals P1 plus P2 plus PN, P3, P4, P5, P6, whatever. We have Charles' law. Think of Charles and Celsius or temperature. We have Henry's law, Henry's Heineken, all right, and Graham's law. Okay. Last thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the physiologic atmospheric zones, okay? Our atmosphere is divided into um, a series of zones, okay? And these zones have several names. Um, they have, uh, you know, traditional names um, like trophosphere, uh, which is the lower level, and, and, and that's, uh, yeah, so that's like, uh, ground, it's like zero up to 10 miles. I think it's like 30, 35,000 um, meters, I think is, is exactly what that is. And, um, but we don't really need to know about that. I mean, trophosphere is the, is the, the zone within the atmosphere that we operate within. We're never going to be operating uh, beyond uh, that. And of course, we're going to be you know, operating much, much lower in the very, very, you know, lower skin of the trophosphere. Okay. But what is important for you to realize is the physiologic, uh, or how these different zones can be, um, are, are classified, classified um, physiologically. Okay. So you've got, <clears throat> and um, okay, so basically from zero to 10,000 feet, you have this physiologic efficient zone. Okay, and that's what's called physiologic efficient. This is the, the zone at which we operate most of the time, and this is the zone uh, within the atmosphere that uh, you know, humans can, can function without a whole lot of problems. Okay, so from 10,000 feet up to 50,000 feet, this is what we call the physiologic deficient zone. And this is that zone where oxygen is required, um, especially when you get above that, that 15,000 foot mark. Okay. This is called the physiologic zone or the physiologic deficient zone. Beyond that, you've got what's called the space equivalent. And this stretches from 50,000 feet up to, um, a hundred, uh, well, a couple sources say like 120 miles. Other sources say a thousand miles. So really it's irrelevant. We're never going to be here, but this is called the space equivalent zone. This is that zone where it, which you can't survive. And then beyond that is space. So you've got the physiologic efficient zone and the physiologic deficient zone. Those are kind of the two zones that you need, need to be aware of. Physiologic efficient goes from sea level to 10,000 feet. The physiologic deficient zone goes from 10,000 feet to 50,000 feet. What else can I say about that? I think that's it. Um, there will be a few other um, tips that I'm going to include on the PDF that will be available over at FlightCrit. Um, when you go to FlightCrit, click on the resource tab at the top, and below that you will see uh, Google Hangouts. Click there, and when you click on the replay, of this uh, broadcast, you will be offered uh, a download uh, PDF of my notes 
uh, for this. I hope this was very, I hope this was useful. If you did like it, um, I encourage you, please share this with everybody else that you know. The more people that I can get involved, the better this will be. Leave your comments um, over at uh, flightcrit.com, or you can also leave your comments for the broadcast uh, on Google+. Plus. Um, and if you, uh, you can also leave this over at the Flight Crit Facebook group. Uh, I want to thank you for your time this morning. Uh, we went over a little bit, but we also got started a little bit late. Um, if you, again, if you do like this, um, come over, sign up for my email newsletter. I will be, uh, if you go over to flightcrit.com at the bottom of the page, um, you can sign up for my email, email newsletter. You can also send me a voice message uh, using the speak, speak pipe tool. In the very near future, I'm going to be launching the Flight Crit uh, podcast where I'll be talking about the uh, prepar preparations for the FPC exam, as well as uh, you know, all things uh, flight EMS uh, related. Um, I'm going to be including your questions, uh, the audio file for your questions in the broadcast, uh, and uh, I'll be sending out a special gift, a uh, special thank you gift to those people who have their questions uh, featured on the show. Uh, I also broadcast on Periscope, and if you're not familiar with Periscope, it is a app that you can download for your iPhone and also your Android phone. It is a it, uh, Periscope is owned by Twitter, so if you already have a Twitter account, then you already have a Periscope account. Follow me uh, at FlightCrit on both Periscope and Twitter. Uh, Periscope, I do live broadcasts. You'll be notified uh, on your phone, similar to this, but they're just kind of impromptu. Uh, I'll go on there. I'll talk about uh, you know what I'm doing at work. I'll show you know take you through uh, setting up ventilators, just all kinds of stuff related to um, flight medicine. Uh, I'll just kind of do a little impromptu training session, so it's super valuable. Uh, and then follow me on Twitter, uh, please. If you like this, share it. Tell your friends. Tell them to follow me at FlightCrit on Twitter and on Periscope. Come on over to Facebook.com forward slash FlightCrit. You can join the community there. There's both a page where I uh, uh, announce uh, what's going on, announce these broadcasts. There's also a group um, where people uh, interact and, and share their ideas and strategies and tips for flight medicine. And especially, uh, come on over to flightcrit.com. Uh, sign up for my email newsletter. If you would like to actually participate in the conversation, right down here at the bottom of your screen, it says me right now. It says you. Uh, I can have up to 10 people in the broadcast. You can uh, be a part. It's just like having a conversation. So I don't know if you've ever done a, a Google Hangouts on air, but uh, you can actually be a part of the conversation. You can ask me questions, and it's a back and forth. It's a dialogue rather than me just talking to you. Um, that way I really know that I'm giving you um, the the information that you want. I'm, I'm answering your questions and really making this successful for you. So I'm going to hang on here for a few more few more minutes. If you do have further questions, um, ask them uh, in the questions tab. Um, and uh, you know, I was hoping that uh, you, a few more people would pop into the conversation. But uh, you can also go over to YouTube and search for Flight Crit, and you'll find these broadcasts so you can watch them again later. Um, please give them a thumbs up or a plus sign. Uh, wherever you are, if you like this, share this. Um, give it a thumbs up. Give it a like, and uh, I sure hope that this was beneficial to you. Next week, next week, next week, next week. What are we going to be doing next week? What do you want to do? What do you want to do next week? Let's see here. Hmm. Airway management? Airway management is massive. What do we want to do next week? We want to do trauma? Airway? Let's see. I'll tell you what. Why don't you come on over? Here's what I want you to do. Okay? I want you to go to Google Plus and do a search for Flight Crit. You'll find my community there. Send me your comments of what you'd like me to cover next week. Or uh, go over to Twitter and Search for me, uh, search for my uh, uh, search for me there at Flight Crit, and tweet me your requests for next week's topic for the flight paramedic exam. 
And, uh, or you could come on over to flightcrit.com and send me a comment there. Okay. Again, uh, this is going to be posted up on, uh, uh, on flightcrit.com under Google Hangouts. You can also find it at, uh, YouTube and there will be a, a special PDF with the notes from this lecture available for you to download uh, from the website. So go on over to flightcrit.com, download uh, my notes, and rewatch the video, share it. And I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. I really hope that this was beneficial. I hope you tune in next Friday, same time at 9 a.m. Mountain Time uh, for Flight Crit Friday. So thanks so much. Fly safe and live well. Bye-bye.